beautiful people. Let's go over this briefly without making it too long. There are two tools, two very important and crucial tools that you must know if you intend to hold someone liable or if someone is holding you liable for some contention that's real or not. The first tool is default judgment. The second is summary judgment. This is in accordance with Federal Rules of Civic Procedure, Rule 56, and this is scattered all around rules on the state and federal level. These two tools, default judgment and summary judgment, are very, very, very similar, but for two specific purposes. We'll be talking about this in details in the future as to how you can use it, but as an introduction, what is the difference between summary judgment and default judgment? Default judgment exists when someone has failed to answer at the beginning of the case. Meaning, you file a suit, they didn't respond at all. Summary judgment is they did respond, but whatever it is they respond to, you've laid to rest and it's been killed. And instead of you wasting the time to go to trial and do all the deposition and waste your time and resource, just do a summary judgment. A motion to dismiss is essentially and technically also a summary judgment, but on the end of the defendant. A motion to dismiss is always done by the defendant. A voluntary stipulation of dismissal can be done by the plaintiff also, but usually it's done by the defendant. Which basically says, well, you should just dismiss this case so we won't go to trial. That is the whole significance and that is the whole purpose of a motion to dismiss. So that we don't go to trial in the matter because, well, there's nothing else to talk about, so just dismiss this case. So a motion to dismiss is a type of summary judgment. But given that a motion to dismiss is a type of summary judgment usually used by a defendant, what about the plaintiff if the plaintiff is not voluntarily dismissing? The only case the voluntary dismissal of the plaintiff can come up is if a sediment has occurred or what if a sediment has not occurred. The form of summary judgment for a plaintiff will be after they've rebutted all the contentions and the opposing party's motion to dismiss. Then you say, look, they have no claim. Give me a summary judgment, which is accept my damages and award that I've requested as a form of restitution or throw this man in jail for whatever this amount is if you're bringing criminal claims. Whereas a default judgment says the exact same thing with the exception that they defaulted. They didn't even come and say, hey, this is right or this is wrong. They just kept silent. Hence, they defaulted. Default judgment is governed mainly by Rule 55, but it's also scattered. Summary judgment is governed by Rule 56. Summary judgment is basically, all right, we have went back and forth. We've decided, okay, what you're saying is actually not right. Default judgment is, we started the whole situation, but you've yet to even say nothing. And guess what? There are timeline and deadline for response. If they didn't say anything within the timeline and deadline of response, or through the timeline and deadline of summons, or through the timeline and deadlines of waiver of summons, then a default judgment comes in because they get quiet. Believe it or not, most people who go through any type of cases, the reason why the case is being adjudicated against them is because they are in default judgment. Most people don't speak up. Most people just keep quiet in cases. But keep these two tools in mind because they will be very important for you to use. Default judgment is rule 55. Summary judgment is rule 56. And every time you come in as a plaintiff and they say, all right, we're going to move to dismiss now because that's the only tool they can use as a defense against you. To close whatever it is you're saying. Once you rebut their motion to dismiss, your next step is to do a summary judgment. If they never even showed up, usually if you set your things up right, they, some of them will not because what's the point of showing up? And the reason why they will not show up is if you sue them personally. Now, a lot of people have this thing whereby they think, should I sue them personally or in their court official capacity? Do both. And usually what they will do is they will, they will respond through an attorney in the quote official capacity but they will not respond personally 
And that leaves an open door for default judgment against them in their personal capacity. Because they will try to just slip through the door, slip through the crack. So there's a foundational introduction. Default judgment versus summary judgment. Very powerful tools that you can use. In summary, default judgment is only, only used when the opposing party has failed to respond in any way. You know, like you do your administrative process and you put them in default because they acquiesced or failed to respond. Which is another thing. Most people, when they do the court administrative process of notarial presentment, the other party that they're sending those documents to send them something back. It might not be completely related, it might not be completely satisfactory to the demands made by the claimant, but nonetheless, by their mere act of sending you something back relating to that process that you're doing, they remove their liability of default judgment. And a lot of people don't know that loophole. In order for you to not be in default, you can say anything. Just say something related to the matter and you're cool. And that's what attorneys do by doing a quote, notice of appearance on the record. There was, there would appear. Attorney and parents so-and-so, notice of appearance so-and-so. That removed the presumption of default judgment. And the only path that's not open is summary judgment. So in summary, default judgment is only specific to when someone just said nothing. And automatically you win by it. Default. Summary judgment is if they've said something, no matter whether it's proper, no matter whether it's valid, no matter whether it actually puts you in a corner or not. So long as, the, as there's no dispute, which will require you to show that whatever this man or woman said makes no sense, it's dead, it's inapplicable, then it's summary judgment. If you want to use these tools, and you don't comprehend these two differences. The other party on the other end will see clearly that you're not quite clear about what's going on and what you're trying to do. Most people, when they do default judgment, the other party has responded one way or the other. Might not be exactly what you wanted to say, but all that's required to remove presumption of default and the judgment thereof is just to say something regarding the matter. Then the appropriate remedy then will be a summary judgment rather than a default judgment. Just because someone says something back to what you're contending against them does not necessarily mean they've abated the liability that you're bringing against them. And it's that simple. It goes much deeper when it comes to taking people's property, garnishing people's checks. And even more importantly, as applicable to what most people are openly aware of, enforcing their private contract and finalizing a process of enforcing their private contract by balancing the books in these public courts. Now the note of default judgment is some people personally. Let me tell you a little secret or tool that attorneys will use. See, when you sue someone personally, there are two main things that will cause them to not respond. The first is shock, because once you actually know how to sue people and join people personally, properly, the other party will be in so much shock that by the time they get their own attorney consultations and pay the attorney about 400 bucks an hour or try to figure out what's going on, that is if they know the importance of knowing what's going on as to how they will be personally held liable. Believe it or not, most people out here that do ridiculous things that leaves them personally liable are actually ignorant of how to really fix problems when you bring the problem to them. So say you do it properly, one of the reasons they will not respond out of the tourism is actually shock, believe it or not. The second reason is because they think that, well, if you cannot prove the lifting of the corporate veil principle that we've went over, then that means they cannot be held personally liable. So usually when you sue, you will sue personally and in their corporate capacity so that you can double the money or so that you can set the record straight that, look, don't do this anymore. It's like a counterattack. Somebody punching you, punching you, and then you just counter and just give them that jab to let them know, okay, don't get too comfortable. Don't get too aggressive in this ring. You just might get it too so that they get the message. That's why you sue them both personally and in their official capacity. So what they will do is the attorney will only respond 
in the official capacity because that's a presumption of business through the corporate veil of the corporation or entity or whatever it is. But what they would do is they would leave the personal capacity blank and not respond in personal capacity. And they would try to feather the personal capacity to the court official capacity and say that, well, unless and until you lift the corporate veil, then, then there's no need for them to respond personally. See, that's the loophole in the secret that they will do. So that now brings the ball back to your court to really know what you're doing as to why and how they qualify personally and as to why and how that 60 day deadline to respond when it comes to summon is important. And what you will do is you will push them by nonetheless doing a default judgment on a personal level. That's presuming you know the principle behind corporate veil because again, one of the things the attorneys will do is they'll try to say, well, we'll only come through the official capacity and try to protect them as an employee. And unless you can prove that they actually did it personally, then, well, they don't have to respond personally, even if they know for a fact that you did it right. What you will do to compel performance or, you know, most of the time they don't expect you to know how to use default judgment. So they will gamble. Everything you do when it comes to this thing is about making the right move during the right time. They will gamble on that. And once you put in that default judgment, they will begin to run around like a chicken without its head, presuming you really set the things up properly. But usually, if you set it up properly, no attorney in their right mind would try to make that gamble. Then in that case, it would just mean that the element of shock has come into play. And presumably, when you sue someone personally, you would have done your research well enough so that when you do a default judgment, triggering the forfeiture, because that's what default judgment is, they basically just forfeit it. Triggering that forfeiture, thereby granting you the relief that you sought in that original verified suit, it would include garnishing their paychecks because they have to get up personally before they enter into that capacity. It would include garnishing and attaching and selling their house by way of the U.S. Marshal if you choose to use that way. Or if none of that occurs, that is where the non-UCC comes in. Once you get that court order, you attach it to a non-UCC. Remember the video we did on the non-UCC? Who was the secure party? Your trust will be. Once your trust becomes a secure party to it, now you can actually sell the monetary value of that non-UCC and that court order and monetize and liquidate it. Keep that in mind.